first of all, just a very warm welcome. Um, I'm Paru Raman, I'm Chair of the Migration and Diaspora Centre here at SOAS, and we're delighted to be able to welcome Professor Danny Dawling, who's uh, going to give the last uh, lecture in a series that we've had this year. So I just want to say a few words about that to put the lecture into some sort of context first. So during this academic year, the centre has uh, held a series of seminars and lectures which have explored the relationship between the upcoming general election and Britain's migrant communities and British immigration policy more generally. Um, what we've tried to do is offer an alternative perspective to the dominant narratives that we hear every day about migrants and immigration in this country. As I'm sure many of you will be, will be painfully aware, uh, much public debate is often extremely discriminatory towards migrants and also serves the, the, to divide the communities that we all live in. So you could say that we live in a climate of migration misinformation in a way, which is circulated by the media, it's reinforced by politicians, and migrant communities uh, within this discourse, they're routinely racialized. Um, they're judged in very narrow academic terms, considering about how much they contribute to the state or how much they take out of the state. We're very quick to make moral judgments about um, uh, the deserving and the undeserving, genuine refugees versus so-called asylum, bogus asylum seekers. Um, and it's really in this context, it's in this context of this sort of debate that we've had um, uh, in the news today, the, the news about the ongoing um, tragic migrant deaths in the Mediterranean. And of course, the trouble is that um, the internal debate, the domest domestic debate, is not separate from the, um, what's going on in the wider context. So one clearly informs the other. And it's exacerbated, by the way, that the politicians are dealing with this so-called situation um, as a form of risk management um, about where calculations have to be made. Uh, it's based on perceived threats to uh, nation states and projected outcomes. And I would uh, suggest that there's no surer way for us to lose sight of our common humanity. I don't really know how else we can explain uh, the terms within which this discourse is taking place currently in this country. Um, and of course, although this might be for multiple reasons, historic reasons, as well as the politics of what's going on at the moment, uh, the human tragedy which is unfolding before us is quite clearly partly due to the racist um, and discriminatory immigration policy which is run by the states in Europe and elsewhere. Somehow that's become rather invisible in this current debate. Uh, so one question I would ask is what leads to this invisibility? And I would suggest that it's sometimes an outcome of the very nar narrow, narrow vantage points that we adopt when we look at these issues, and I'm including academics in that. So, uh, in this last in our series, I'm really delighted that Professor Danny Dawling is going to help us by look, helping us look at the bigger picture, okay? And I think he's going to do that very well. Danny Dawling is Professor of Geography at Oxford. Um, he joined in 2013 when he took up uh, the Halford McKinder Professorship. Um, some of you might know him through his uh, cartographic work. Is cart cartographic a word? I'm not sure. But um, the World Mappers website, if you're not familiar with it, I would recommend it to you very highly. It's absolutely fantastic and engaging way of uh, learning about issues that might otherwise seem a bit obscure to us. Uh, today he's going to tell us the story of Britain's diminishing role in the world and the growing inequality that we see within the borders of the nation state. And he's very well equipped to do this. Earlier in the week I actually went online to... Um, have a look at an overview of what uh, Professor Dawling has published recently, and I have to say that I was tempted to go and have a, a lie down in a darkened room afterwards, <laughs> because he is prolific. <laughs> There's many articles out there he writes on a regular basis on the Times, Higher Education Supplement, and The Guardian, Newt Statesman, interviewed on the BBC, and that's really what I think is, uh, I find most engaging about him, that Danny Dawling is not an academic that stays within the confines of his ivory tower. He goes out there, gets his hands dirty, and puts his argument across in any um, environment that he can. Um, so today, today, Professor Dawling is going to paint this wider picture for us, which explains migration, I think, in a sort of whole series of international relationships and historic events that have been unfolding over time. And I uh, have been told that he's also going to show us some, some new maps. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hand over to Danny Dawling. He's going to talk for about 50 minutes, and that will be followed by questions. So please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, I'm not actually that prolific. I just work with a lot of other people. And I, it, I was just adding it up in my head. And I, I think the majority of people I've worked with in the last few years have either been migrants themselves, they've crossed international borders, or they're the children of migrants. I've worked with very few people like me. 
uh, who are not the children of international migrants. I was also glad that you mentioned our common humanity because I've, I've put down a tag uh, at GeoViews. The maps you're going to see later are produced by Ben Hennig, who's from Germany originally, well, Switzerland, all over the place. He's a normal European, so he doesn't really know where he's from. Uh, but you're going to be the only people who can see these maps because Ben needs to produce his World Atlas of Humanity. So if you like any of the maps I show you, can you just tweet, Ben, get your atlas made uh, to GeoViews? Uh, and we'll move the world a little bit forward. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, about the UK context and the election, and then I'm going to go worldwide, because it's a lot less depressing to look at the planet as a whole, rather than this place. Um, and I, I have reasons in my head as to why the UK is in such a bad place at the moment. You shouldn't think it's always going to be like this, but it is particularly bad right now. Uh, I like drawing maps. Here's a normal map of the last election result. On normal maps, everything always looks blue, no matter what happens, which is why normal maps are a bad idea. Uh, the other two maps are what are called two types of population cartogram, and they make areas where people live proportional to the number of people, so that you can actually see who wins elections and where uh, they win them. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with British politics, red is Labour and left, blue is the Conservatives, there are lots of other parties, they're not as important as they think they are. Um, the purple areas here are the constituencies which the Conservatives won last time. They're suburban, they're all over the place, they tend to be pretty boring areas. And I'm afraid if you don't have a vote in one of those places, you don't really matter come May the 7th. I'm not saying you shouldn't bother voting. Uh, but if you happen to have a vote in one of those places, if you're a student, you can often have a vote in two places, or three, or as many as you like. You're only supposed to vote once, but you can register anywhere where you have an interest. And if it happens to be one of those purple places, that's the place you should be voting if you want to affect uh, the election. And if you're wondering what the parties are playing at, why does Labour produce those mugs with controlled immigration, it's because of that map. That's who they are worrying about, and because of their lack of moral fibre <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah. um, and the Office of National Statistics now produces these things as well, because the basic map essentially is a map of sheet, sheep and white people. Um, if you want to see what Britain's really like, you can't use a normal map. This is the change in voting from 2001 to 2010 in the country. Many parts of the country actually moved away from the Conservative Party um, Scotland moved away, Sheffield where I used to live at this time moved away, Oxford East where I now live actually saw a swing towards Labour. It was only in South West London and Surrey and Essex that the Conservatives became more popular. That was very bad news for them in 2010 because they already held most of the constituencies in those areas. If you're a political party, you want to gain votes in areas where you're doing okay, but you're not winning so that you can win. You don't really want to gain that many votes in areas where you can't win because they're not going to give you an MP. And you really can't be bothered about winning yet more votes in areas where you're already extremely popular because, again, you've already got the MP. And that is what is happening to the Conservative Party at the moment. That is why they couldn't form a government in 2010. These two maps show you the share of the vote for the Liberals and the Conservatives put together. Uh, the bluer areas are where they do better in the vote, the greyer areas are where they do worse. And the map, which is further away from me, is showing you how that turns into seats. Because the first past the post system polarises votes. If you've got a slight advantage in an area, you can win all the constituencies in the county just by being slightly ahead in the polls. So in Oxfordshire, the Conservatives win five of the six constituencies but they're not in a majority anywhere. This is probably the most important graph that I'm going to show you in terms of the election. <coughs> it's a segregation index for Conservative voters. So it's showing you the proportion of Conservative voters you'd have to move around the country at each election from 1918 onwards, right through to 2010, if you were to get an even distribution of Conservative voters everywhere. The Conservative Party used to be more polarised in particular areas in the 1920s and 1930s, including in Scotland where they did well. 
and other parts of the country which were more Protestant and more Unionist. That concentration of Conservative votes in particular areas reduced over time. The party went up and down, they won elections, lost elections, but they spread out more. You ended up with Conservative voters everywhere and with people voting for other parties everywhere in the 1960s and 1970s. And then everything changed in October 1974. In October 1974 there, there was a second election. It's worth remembering that because we could have a second election this time or even a third election. And in October 74, the people of the southeast of England swung to the Conservative Party in large numbers. Not enough for the Conservatives to win the election. Labour actually won that election. But that's your little blip there. Dropped down again slightly in 1979 with Thatcher's mini landslide. And then ever since 1979, the Conservative vote in this country has become more and more polarised into the southeast, into the home counties, into the affluent parts of the country. People have stopped voting Conservative in the north. They've stopped voting Conservative entirely in Scotland. I didn't meet a single Conservative when I lived in Sheffield for 10 years. They stopped existing. No Conservative councillors. And the polarisation is continuing. If that graph goes up again on May the 7th, there is no way the Conservatives will be able to form a majority government, even if they actually get an increase in their vote, because they'll be getting the votes in the areas where they don't need them. Uh, this is polls up until Christmas. They've kind of uh, bubbled along since then. It's not a particularly good graph because it appears to go down for the others because UKIP has suddenly taken out. Uh, but essentially there's a rise in the others. The one interesting thing that's happened since Christmas, to my point of view, is that in the last few weeks we've seen university students move so that now more university students are planning to vote Green than vote Conservative. There are quite a lot of university students who vote Conservative but no longer as many as those who plan to vote Green. Uh, if university students could only ever get their act together, they're an incredibly powerful force. There's about two million of them. They're highly geographically concentrated. They just need to pick one party and stick with it and make some deals with that party and they could hand that party a series of seats. Uh, but student politics isn't clever enough to realise it's worth doing that. This graph looks very similar to that graph of the polarisation of the Conservative vote. It's the share in income of the 1%, the best off 1% in society for six countries. Uh, the countries weren't picked by me, um, but they're a nice summary of what's happened. Everywhere in the rich world was extremely unequal uh, around about 1913. Inequalities have increased, so when that, those graphs come down, that means the rich are taking a smaller share, things are getting better for everybody else. Inequalities reduce because of the cost of the First World War. They reduce because of the fear generated by the Russian Revolution, which was a real tangible fear for the 1%. They saw what happened to the 1% in Russia. Uh, they carried on reducing throughout the Second World War and through to the 1970s. And then with economic crisis in the 70s, different countries went in different directions. And the UK went in the strangest direction of all. In the 1970s of those six countries, the UK was the second most equitable. Only Sweden was more equal than the UK. This is a country I grew up in. This is a country I can remember. Um, it is not a country that you're told about very much now, that we were second only to Sweden amongst large countries, but we were. And then you'll see that the UK line hops over country after country after country as we try to mimic the United States and as our 1% take more and more and the rest are left with less and less. If you include estimates for tax evasion, the 1% are currently taking about 15% of all income. So it's a very, very economically divided country. The most economically divided country in Europe, the poorest fifth of Britain are by far the worst off in Western Europe. Um, our median household, is living on a lower income than the median, the middle household in France and Germany. Uh, politicians in Britain never tell you this, that the, the median is doing better in France and Germany. And that's before housing costs. And we have the highest housing costs for the smallest housing. So part of the underlying political rhetoric of what's gone on in the UK is people have lost out. They felt they've lost out. They felt things would be getting relatively worse. And since 2009, 2010, absolutely worse. 
and they've been told that the reason they've lost out is the immigrants, not the people who are taking 15% of all income. I promise not to show you any other graph as complicated as this. Um, but again, this is another kind of statistic which just isn't shown very much, and it's showing for all large European countries and the USA the proportion of public uh, spending as a share of GDP. The UK is the blue dots with the red line, and if you go right to the end, you'll see that we now have the lowest share of public spending of any of these countries. Uh, we are the sentinel nation for people who want to see what happens if you let the free market rip and cut the state as much as you can. We have now managed to overtake the United States of America and spend less on our public services uh, than the United States of America is spending on its. This is painted as inevitable, as the only way you can go. Um, but if you look at those countries at the top, which are the ones at the bottom of the key, you'll see that there are many different options about how you can organise the state and how you can live. But if nobody tells you that's possible, uh, then you don't tend to imagine those kinds of futures. And you can accept the idea that we just have to cut and cut and cut. The difference between the Labour and the Conservative parties in terms of their spending plans for the next five years is about that on the graph. It matters, it's important, but when you get to vote, if you happen to live in one of those constituencies that matters, the decision you're making is about moving the UK down to there or to there. Nobody's given the option of becoming an average European country. That's not on the cards of any party which has much of a chance of getting very close to power. Even the SNP are not talking about moving Labour towards, heading towards the median European spending. Um, I'm going to show you some of Ben's maps now of Europe. So if you like these maps, don't forget to tweet GeoViews and just tell him to do more of them. This is just a simple way of looking at things like unemployment. We've shaped the countries of Europe according to how many people are registered unemployed. You shouldn't necessarily take this as being a measure of economic failure. Uh, you can get your unemployment rate down to zero quite easily without creating many jobs. Uh, you do it by having the most draconian set of sanctions ever and the lowest rates of unemployment benefit. People will then do anything uh, because they have to do anything. So in the last year, the sanctions to people who are on benefits in Britain, the total amount of money they've been fined if they've broken one of numerous little regulations, uh, has been more money than the entire fines handed out by all the magistrates' courts in the country. Uh, and that's very recent. It's very recent that that has happened. And if you do that, you can get unemployment down very low. Zooming out now to the European level. This is the European Parliament. These are the major party groups in the European Parliament. Uh, the blue group is the Conservative group in the European Parliament, and the red group is the Socialist, or if you like, the Labour group in the European Parliament. And because almost all of the rest of Europe has dem democracy, that is, you can actually vote and your vote matters, unlike in the UK, there is a wider uh, set of parties as a different set of choices and so you have more colours there. And now I'm going to show you those votes distributed across the continent. The first thing is to look at the distribution of Conservative voters across Europe and it looks rather like the population distribution of Europe. Um, that's where the Conservative voters are. There's Conservative voters in Spain and Portugal and in France and Conservative voters in Germany and lots of Conservative voters in Eastern Europe and still quite a lot there were back then, there aren't any more uh, but they were back then in Greece. Uh, you might have noticed that there aren't any Conservative voters in uh, the UK. Uh, that's because people in the UK were not given the choice of voting for a European party that was Conservative. Our Conservative party in this country no longer belongs to the Conservative group in Europe. It belongs to a small group of, of right-wing extremists who are popular in a few parts of Eastern, German, Eastern Europe as well. Um, so that's the group that are uh, current coalition leaders belong to. It's a very odd situation to be in. Here are the Liberals in Europe. We have a few Liberals in Europe, but not very many. If we were a more normal European country, we would have more Liberals. And that's partly because we'd have PR, which would give the Liberals uh, more of a say nationally at Westminster, and that would help them in other elections as well. Here's the so-called European Freedom and Direct Democracy Party, which is UKIP, 
and their friends in Italy. Um, and again, this is a fairly extreme thing. There are extreme parties across Europe. I mean, in a way, the rise of UKIP is kind of a good thing, uh, because you don't really become a normal European country until you get a small semi-fascist party emerge. And so the emergence of UKIP, in a way, could be seen as a signal that we are becoming more European. But most of Europe really doesn't have many people in that particular block of voting. Uh, here's the Greens. And so you see we're behind the curve with Greens. We've got a nascent Green Party, uh, not a properly developed Green Party yet, whereas most of the rest of Europe has a much pro more properly developed Green Party uh, than we do. And again, because of the voting system in Britain that holds new parties back. OK, I'm going to look out from Europe and look out from the UK and look out towards the world because it's a much more interesting picture if you begin to look at what's happening to humanity across the planet it's a much less depressing picture than if you just concentrate on what's happening in the UK, and it may partly explain what's happening in the UK. I've been looking at these kind of maps and images for over 20 years, so I'm very used to them, but almost all of you are going to see these for the first time, so I try not to go through it too quickly, but if you feel you're getting lost by what you see in a minute, that's because you're normal and your brain isn't as elastic. Uh, as some very weird people's brains are. So don't, don't feel surprised if you can't follow all of this. There's a lot of images to show. 7.3 billion people at the moment on the planet. It's not that many. Can appear to be a lot, but it really isn't necessarily a huge number. Here we've just drawn a dot of light for each of those people. But now what we're going to do is going to take the normal map and transform it. So instead of having well, it isn't even land area, that map. It's a really strange map that you normally see. Instead of having the normal map, we're going to make each small part of the world proportional to the number of people who live there so that you can see what humanity looks like on the map. This is the planet of people that you're living on. So there's the normal map again. And you'll see that the Sahara will begin to disappear, the Himalayas will begin to disappear. India will grow because there's over a billion people in India. China will grow because, there's, again, there's over a billion people in China. Europe will shrink because it is a small part of the world of humanity getting smaller because we are having fewer and fewer <coughs> children. And that is the world that you are living in. And what we're going to do now is show you various things draped over that world so you can get an idea of, of where you are, what planet you're on and what's happening. So first of all, major cities. Here are some of the largest cities on the planet, and as you can see, they're distributed fairly evenly over the population. But there are parts of, well, certainly Africa, but parts of India and China, where they're going to have a few more major cities in future because of the number of people that are there. Urbanisation is, is likely to carry on at a greater rate there than elsewhere, simply because of the weight of humanity. In contrast, Latin America is already the most urbanised part of the planet. If we just zoom into Europe again, and I'll do some more pictures of the UK before we zoom out uh, to try to keep some of you, you with me who I may have lost, you'll see that we are a large chunk of Europe. We are a significant chunk of the population of Europe. Um, if we leave the European Union, it is a big issue. Possibly it would help mainland Europe move forward faster than if we stay with it. It's an interesting question to ask, and I'll, I'll end talking about that. Um, but we are a large part of Europe, and we are largely a series of cities, and the bulk of us is down here in the southeast in London. Spain is Madrid, France is Paris-centred, Greece really is simply Athens and a few outlying places. So when people tell you there's a Greek economic crisis, they're really talking about one city. That's how it looks from the point of view of human beings. So this is this country zoomed in to get an idea about where matters. And it's similar to those maps of elections I showed you before. So I have just come from that little city squeezed between Birmingham and London. Right. I'm going to show you these maps now shaded by something else. This is the regions of England and the boroughs of London. And the size of them has been made proportional to the amount of money spent buying houses and flats each year. Just to give you an idea about what the housing market looks like. If that's confusing, or if you want to get angry, that's the amount of money spent every year on flats and houses. So if you take 
two digits off that and get it to take 1% of it, you work out how much money estate agents are making each year, which is a lot of money. But you can also see just how precarious uh, the UK housing market is. You can see the crash that happened in 2008-9. You can see how we're building up uh, potentially towards another crash. The more prices rise, the more likely a crash will be. Slow down, the crash is somewhat less likely. I'll skip that one. This is an attempt to look at overseas money and where it's hiding. Um, we officially count as a tax haven under international definitions of tax havens. Again, we're a strange country. And just one more use of this kind of map to show you. Uh, here's nuclear power stations, and we've put rings around them at 20 kilometres and 30 kilometres, and I think at 80 kilometres, which are the kind of levels that people worry about if somebody blows one of these things up, or we have an earthquake. We're lucky we don't have too many earthquakes. Exactly the same map, but drawn over people. And you can do the same thing for trauma centres or universities, whatever you like. And the interesting thing here is you'll see that in London, or at least this part of London, we're not that near the exclusion zone of a nuclear power station. Uh, and it's not because we have a lot of people here, because there are a lot of people living up in uh, Yorkshire and Manchester and Newcastle, but they're allowed to live within uh, that distance of a nuclear power station. They're just less important people. Uh, the reason I think you can say this is that Ben has drawn these same maps for France and Germany, and surprise, surprise, Paris and Bonn and Berlin, they're all excluded as well. Um, so it's just different ways of, of looking at data and looking at it over, over people. And here is Germany. Here's a detailed map of Germany. Um, the colouring, I'll show you for the whole world in a minute, the colouring over there is population change. Uh, the blue areas have been losing population. The population is going down. The population is going down in, in most of Europe. In Italy, they only have 1.3 children per couple. Uh, they've had only 1.3 children per couple for years and years and years. In Barcelona, it's below 1.1. Uh, you know, if you're worried about population and immigration, you'd be sending boats down to the Libyan coast to bring people in to make up for all the children we have not been having in Europe for so long. But in Germany, the population is going down in the east in particular as people leave, but in the industrial Ruhr, and in the red areas of suburbanisation, it's increasing slightly. Here's the worldwide picture of population change. Uh, the world hit, hit peak baby in 1990. We've never had as many babies again as the number of babies we had in 1990. So those babies, most of them have survived, are aged 25 at the moment. The world may never have as many 25-year-olds again as it has now. Um, there are a lot of 25-year-olds in the world. There are a lot of 25-year-olds fairly near the edge of Europe. It's one reason why quite a few people are trying to come into Europe, because there are quite a lot of people. But we've had deceleration of population since 1971. It looks absolutely set to continue. The average family in the world have three children now. Uh, their children are dead set on only having two children each. If you only have two children, you have population stability. The world is set to stop growing in terms of people sometime within the next 100 years, I think nearer 70 years. Uh, UN estimates vary from saying we're going to get to 9 billion to 10 to 11. It all depends on mini baby booms going on at the moment. Globally, only in the red areas are you predicted relatively rapid change. And in the past, all those estimates ended up being wrong. So in the Yemen, there was very high change predicted. I would be very surprised if that increase in the Yemen actually happens. It's always somewhere where there's a disaster, where you have relatively high population change. When things go wrong for people, they have more babies. Uh, when there's war, people have more babies. When there's famine, people have more babies. When there's economic uncertainty, people have more babies. When you get rid of a welfare state, people have more babies, because what do you do if you're not going to get a pension? You have a baby. That's your pension. When there's stability, when things calm down, when you get a choice, when women manage to get the slightest piece of power, ever so small, you have fewer babies. You can measure the power of women by the number of babies that people have. 
Uh, essentially, men tend to want an extra half to an extra one baby than women. Um, if, any, if any of you are female, there's various good reasons for why this goes on. But, you know, only one of the two of you has actually got to have the thing. Right? And after you've done it once or twice, being asked to do it a third or a fourth time, um, over half the world is now below fertility replacement level. This is an incredibly good news story. Unbelievably good news story. It's coupled with an amazing news story about infant mortality. About three or four years ago, we had a 5% drop, as far as we can tell, in infant mortality in one year. Probably, I think, the best news story on the planet in all history. 5% drop in babies dying in one year. They've been going down and down and down. The faster infant mortality drops, the fewer babies people choose to have. So there are very, very good things going on worldwide. And, and I'm happy to talk in questions about it, but it gets you out of the kind of depression of austerity and the cuts and idiot racist policies in Britain, these kind of good news stories. It's also linked to these policies, of course, because if we are heading for a world of stability and a dramatic reduction and shortage of young people worldwide, then in 40 or 50 or 60 years' time, when people look back and say, what do you mean you are trying to stop young people coming into your country? They'll find it hard to understand what was going on. Now, it is not hard to see why people think in the way they do at the moment, because it's been such a long time since we last saw a population fall worldwide. The last population fall worldwide was probably shortly after the Black Death. Uh, and after the Black Death, the power of labour rose. People's wages rose. There was a shortage of, of human beings. And we're heading again to a shortage of human beings. There's already a shortage of human beings in China. That's what happens if you have so few children for so long in China. In China, the average number of, of children per couple had already fallen from six to just about two before the one-child policy came in. It fell from six to two in a generation and then goes down to just over one. So you have a huge number of people who have two parents and four grandparents. That enables you to move forward economically very, very fast because your adult population are not spending their time looking after children because there are not children. But it's a thing you can only pull off once. You can only do that once. All the blue areas in China are all the areas of China which are now currently falling in terms of total population. So the largest part of the world in terms of people where population is falling is in China. China also contains those red areas. Those are parts of China which are increasing in population. Not because people are having babies, but because people from the countryside are walking in to those areas. And the second largest part of the world with population falls is Europe. The data is slightly out of date for the USA. Since 2008, the USA has now joined the club and is the population of the USA is falling in terms of fertility. Uh, an estimate of where the wealth of the world is, or GDP over people. And then I'll skip over the environmental maps, um, but we really should look at these things from the point of view of people. If you look at earthquakes, physical geographers love earthquakes. Um, if an earthquake happens in the middle of nowhere, it's not very important. If it happens where many people live, it does matter. And again, look at southern Europe, and you'll see that near to here, we have a large population who are at risk of earthquakes. Volcanoes, distributed over the population rather than over space. Tropical storms. And I'm going to show you a little animation now about the cold winter of 2013. And the point of showing you these various things is that we are getting climate change. We're beginning to be able to measure the effects of climate change and to see it come in and to see the effects over us as a group, over humanity as a whole. Right. Who is affected when the cold weather comes in? Which people are most affected? I'll show you a little bit about water now. These are the kind of things that matter. People need water. So this is the rains as they fall over the population of the planet. We have enough water for everybody. There was lots of worries about water running out, but it would be good if people 
were to move or stay near to where the water sources were and were not to move and populate areas without water, particularly California, if you've been watching the news last few, few weeks. Um, but that gives you an idea about how the monsoons move across the population. And the water matters in terms of producing the food. And this is just a very different way of, of looking at things from the point of view of can we have immigration controls and will those ships carry on bringing the food uh, to us. I'm going to stretch the world even further now just to make sure I do lose almost everybody and then I'll bring it back uh, to people. But here's the planet drawn, instead of drawing areas proportional to people, I'm drawing it uh, proportional to water. Or rather I should say Ben's drawing it. So if you like these things, don't, don't forget to tweet GeoViews and tell him to get the atlas done. And this is the planet changing month by month as the rainfall moves across the planet. These are the kind of things we need to worry about with 7.3, 8.3, 9.3 billion people. This is, this is what will matter because we need a stable planet. We need people not facing drought. If we have people facing drought and destitution, it's not that large numbers will suddenly migrate across uh, to other places, those kind of silly fears about mass migration because of people leaving areas. People will have more children. If, they, if their lives are made more precarious. And we don't really need to get up to 11, 12 or 13 billion people. This is the world with every little square of latitude and longitude drawn proportional to the population growth, I think, in the last 25 years. And you'll see we've got population growth in the UK. We've actually got population growth in, in London and the South East. We're up to 63 million people now. UK has just under 1% of the world's adults and only half a percent of the world's children uh, living in the UK. The growth has been concentrated in India and in Africa and to a lesser extent in those parts of China which are the urban parts, that's Chongqing, the world's largest city, which is the largest area of China that you can see there. And if we now look at population decline, this is each little square of latitude and longitude drawn in proportion to the number of people who no longer live there because the population has gone down. The largest area of population decline in the world is many rural parts of China, all drawn here in proportion to the number of people who no longer live in those parts. And again, Europe, and in particular Russia. Russia has absolutely collapsed in terms of population in the last 25 years. Eastern Europe's been collapsing. You've got a small reduction down there in South Africa. And you can see the declines in various parts of the UK over that period. So some parts decline, some parts grow. The most interesting part of the world in terms of demography at the moment is probably China, uh, simply because of what's happened and what's happened so fast. So this animation is going too fast for you, but it's just showing you how different the map of the working age population is in China as it moves towards the coast to where the children are. Many of them are being left with the grandparents. Remember, there's a lot of grandparents. There won't be a lot of grandparents in future. They're going to die. But at the moment, there are a lot of grandparents. The children are being left with the grandparents. The parents are in dormitories in the large cities making iPhones so that you can Facebook your friends from anywhere in London. And it's, it's a dramatic changing picture. We have to worry about food in the world, but we don't have to worry that much about food. We currently produce enough food for everybody on the planet. We probably produce slightly too much. Uh, we're wasting, according to some estimates, half of the food, and at least half a billion of us, including me, heading up towards a billion of us, are eating too much of it. Um, people worry about fertilizer. They worry about can we carry on producing as much food but the brilliant thing about food, unlike other items, is that if you consume a lot of it, it's not good for you. Now, if you imagine that wasn't the case, if you imagine that you could eat 10 times more food than somebody else, you could suddenly see what a problem you'd have with food.
Here's the pattern of water insecurity at the moment, which populations have the most insecure water and hence where the crops are most likely to fail. And I'm going to show you where people are not. So this is the inverse. This is areas made large if they're a long way away uh, from where people are. And we're getting more of these areas. We're actually getting a return to wilderness in many parts of the world. As you get rural depopulation, as people come into the cities, more and more parts of the planet are emptying out of people. If you want to see this at a very advanced stage, go to Japan and go out to Tokyo and go out to the farmlands of Japan where the elderly are farming the fields and go into forest there and watch what happens to the forest when nobody's looking after the forest. Uh, so this is, this is already happening. Here's Germany and the UK in terms of where you need to go if you want to get away from people. Uh, but the good news about this, if you're being optimistic about the future, is as we concentrate into cities, there are more and more places to go, not necessarily that far away if you want to get away from it all. You don't have to fly to the South Pacific to do that. May the 7th in all of this is a blip. There is a much, much bigger story of what's happening to humanity going on than what happens with the UK government in this country. It does matter, it matters how you vote, it matters how our politicians behave, but they're just a small part of a small continent which itself is becoming less and less significant over time. It just finds it hard to accept that, and in particular the UK finds it really, really hard to accept that. Or certain people in the UK, people whose parents were incredibly powerful and rich and whose grandparents were even richer. And I can see why they find it hard. You know, if Granny and Grandad were some of the most powerful people on the planet, if your great-great-grandparents were slave owners and owned plantations, as is in the case of our Prime Minister, then, you know, what do you do? Do you say, I come from a legacy which isn't particularly great? Or do you say, it was good and we need to bring the great back into Britain, we need to start winning the global race again? And I think if you look at the decline, economic decline of the country and look at the top echelons, you can begin to think how they think and why they think. Because accepting what's really happened is, is very difficult for them to do. Just show you a few more pictures and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, this is a famous image. This is the Earth at night. You'll have seen this image, but over a normal map. On a normal map, when you see this image, you think that's where people are and the dark areas are where people are not. This is very different because people are everywhere here. We've got rid of all the places where people don't live. And it alters the meaning of the map entirely. If an area is dark on this map, either people to have no electricity, which is a declining proportion of people on the planet, all the people in that area are clever enough that they're not wasting their electricity powering lights to shine up at the sky so that a satellite can pick it up. So this is now a map of light pollution rather than a map of where people are, just by altering the projection about how we look at it. And the brightest part now is Cairo and the Nile. About five years earlier, the brightest part was Tokyo. But Japan shut down a quarter of its electricity generation because of the tsunami. And part of that meant they had to turn some of the neon lights off in Tokyo. Um, they were a bit worried that some of the elderly were going to die in Japan because they couldn't afford to run air conditioning. As it was, we didn't have an increase in deaths amongst the elderly in Japan. People started walking up stairs rather than using the lift. But you need a disaster like a tsunami to be able to see that you can actually survive with a quarter less energy. Here are all the countries of the world drawn by population. They look very strange, but most of them, you wouldn't know what they look like anyway. <laughs> right. Here's the centre of the world from a human point of view. It's in India. Uh, it's actually here. Ben and I thought of buying it. Um, we could have bought a small plot very cheaply, but then we realised it moves as people move. Um, it's there in India. And the reason it's the centre is that when you take all the oceans out, this is the map you get. 
And if you can remember way back to the beginning and the normal map of the world, which is centred with the UK at eye level in the middle because it's such an important place, <laughs> that's naturally where it has to be. Here, the United Kingdom is a small, cold little rock on the edge of humanity. It's just a different, <laughs> different projection, different way of looking at, at where we are. Um, and that's the planet you live in, that's where the people are, and it's stabilising. That'll be your future and your children's future. Uh, there's even a possibility that people might start to migrate towards where it's warmer and a bit more comfortable to live. Yeah, even with a bit of global warming, it's still a bit cold in some of these latitudes. Um, but there are things we've got to worry about. This is how many planets you need if you all behave like the people in these countries. So we always have a go at the USA. If everybody behaves like people in the USA, we'd need four planets. Um, but for us, it's three. So we're not doing that well. That's the red areas. I think Japan gets down to two. Japan's very, very good, but you still need two planets, which is too many. If we take the same colours but put it over the population, it doesn't look so bad because it's the areas with fewer people which are behaving most badly. But if you do the same thing and put it over money, which is more proportional to the actual amount of pollution caused, it looks worse. And if you look at the size of China and the size of the USA, they're similar because China and the USA are both polluting by the same amount. It's just that China has many more people in it than the USA and individually those people are polluting far less each. Here's the world shaped by the number of aeroplanes flying over people's heads. Every year, there are more and more people on the planet who never fly. The number of people who are never flying is going up far faster than the number of people who ever get to fly. And here's the world shaped by GDP. And this brings me back to UK politics. I'll never forget the last Labour government, Gordon Brown saying how it was important to get GDP growth up to 2%, 3% a year. Wanting to get GDP growth up to 2 or 3% a year is wanting this map to become more and more unequal. Wanting to have economic growth in those areas which have the richest economies to begin with is a recipe for growing inequality. What's actually happened since 2008 is the most remarkable crossover where North America and Europe and to a much lesser extent Japan have seen economic decline and in Africa, from a very low base, you have for the first time in 40 years growth. In Asia, continued growth. In Latin America, continued growth. And you have what the economists told us would always happen naturally. We're beginning to get what looks like a very slight convergence in world economies because of the collapse of a market system. Just uh, half a dozen more maps and then I'll finish. So please think of some questions to ask me. This is what North America looks like from the point of view of people. Uh, the colours are altitude. So all those people living at high altitude living in Mexico City. North America is a sea of cities. Right. Here's South America, even more urbanised. If anybody's from Australia and New Zealand, uh, this is how small you are compared to your neighbours. And here's East Asia. And again, this animation just to show you how dramatic the changes are, the difference between where the children are, their parents and the grandparents are across China. South Asia, mainly India, Bangladesh and Pakistan. So many people living in Bangladesh, although the fertility rate in Bangladesh has come right down, that you can see the detail in the delta because of the number of people who are living there. The Middle East, where we have some of the high rates of population growth at the moment because we have some of the greatest instability at the moment. Here's Africa, and if you look carefully, you can spot Lagos and large parts of Nigeria. An idea where people are. There's Russia, shrunken down to be largely Moscow, and a few outlying parts. So it worries our politicians enormously what's happening in Russia, but in terms of people, you're looking at a country that's becoming smaller than Turkey. And there's the European, well, the European Union and a few bits uh, further east. 
just to end with. Um, politics is selection, just say something about it. We, d we don't know, this is the most unpredictable election that there has been for many years, since at least 1992. Uh, people got 1992 wrong because people lied. If any of you, you're too young to remember 92, uh, but in 92 people lied to the pollsters. Uh, they said they were going to vote Labour, but they didn't mean it. Um, <laughs> because uh, enough people uh, wanted to keep their taxes low. But they knew they were naughty. They knew they were being selfish, so they told po pollsters that they are going to vote Labour, and they didn't. So the Conservatives won that last election of, of those long Conservative years. People could be lying again to pollsters now. Uh, but if they're telling the truth to pollsters, then this looks incredibly close. Uh, this country has no constitution, so there are no rules for what happens in the event of what's most likely to happen. Uh, in short, an old woman called Elizabeth has to decide what to do when somebody turns up at her house in a car and says they want to form a government. Uh, the newspapers and even the BBC will tell you that there are various rules, but there are no rules. And so it's going to be interesting to watch what happens, but also how it's painted, how it's portrayed, how the result is, is said to matter or, or not to matter. If you're trying to work out how to vote and you worry about migration and immigration, it is very difficult. Um, in a way, it is relatively easy if you don't look like what UKIP stand for. Although if you would like the United Kingdom to rapidly become a normal European country, I do suspect that the fastest way in which that would happen is UKIP doing well. Because if UKIP did well and formed part of a coalition with the Conservatives, say, and immediately changed immigration rules and had a referendum and we left the EU, can you think how fast people who felt not welcome in this country would leave to go to Paris or Berlin or somewhere else? How many months would it take for the housing market to crash with all those people leaving the country? What happens to the economy of a country when that happens? I'm not advocating voting UKIP to make the UK normal, um, but just trying to take you through the scenarios. You might think that the Greens are by far uh, the best party to vote for on these kind of issues, but it's always interesting to ask the Greens in detail what they really believe about immigration. Uh, they, tend, they tend to get a little bit worried when you do that, um, partly because the main reason why we need to build 200 or 300,000 homes a year is because we're lucky and more people are coming to the country. No politician ever link, links the housing crisis to immigration, uh, but the two are absolutely linked. If we had no net immigration, we'd have to replace houses that wore out, but you wouldn't need more housing. We need more housing because more people have arrived. And if more people don't arrive, you won't need more housing. Uh, quite a lot of people in the Green Party are quite worried about building the housing where people want to come to, which often includes on the edges of green belts in southern cities, within cycling distance in the middle of those cities. There's a common argument that's made on the green side of politics that if you let people into a country that pollutes more, everybody coming will increase the amount of pollution that happens. It'd be far better if people didn't come and stayed somewhere where they polluted less. It's a very short-term argument because one thing that happens when people migrate across borders is that they almost always, not always, but almost always, uh, revert their fertility to very near the average of the group that they join. So the faster we let people move around the planet, the faster the population decline will occur. Because when people turn up in the United States, they have fewer children than they would have had if they stayed in Mexico. When people get into Italy from Egypt, they have fewer children in Italy than they would have had in Egypt. So if you're really worried about world population and pollution, you want as much migration as possible uh, for it to happen. And the other good reason for migration occurring is that those parts of the world which are ageing rapidly, ageing will be less of an issue. Not everything can be done by fit elderly people if you have migration of the young. But we're a side issue. The big issue is India and China. China is ageing, India isn't. And if you really want to look at where something needs to happen, it's over that side of the world and really much less over here. 
Thank you very much. I think that's 50 minutes. Uh, please think of questions to ask me. Thank you.